Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak here. Um, SPIE is uh, not one of my usual uh, conferences, and I'm talking about detectors which are based on mass rather than uh, spectroscopy. So um, I hope you'll bear with me. I'm also talking about a mission to a comet, and we're talking about timescales much, much shorter than the ones that uh, Richard was talking about. We're talking about something which was formed 4,567 million years ago. I mean, uh, Richard's talking about, oh, 3.75. I can talk about 4,567, 4567 million, because that is the sort of precision and also the sort of accuracy with which we can measure um, our, our local solar system, which is uh, very, very good. So uh, this is a picture of 67P, churyumov gerasimenko which was the focus and target of the Rosetta mission. I'm just going to give you a very brief background to the mission, and then I'm going to focus a bit more on the Ptolemy instrument, which is the instrument that I'm associated with. Uh, and my confession here is that most of the slides have been uh, borrowed from the PI of the Ptolemy instrument. Fortunately, he's my husband, so he didn't mind me borrowing them. <laughs> Okay, so why, why do we want to go to a comet? Um, well, one of the major questions that we want to know is how did life get going on the Earth? You know, where, did, where did life come from? Is it something which sprang spontaneously from building blocks which were indigenous to the Earth from the time the, the Earth formed, or has it been added subsequently? Now, we know from the fantastic images that uh, ALMA has produced of protoplanetary disks that there is a structure to a protoplanetary disk. And we can see this in the, uh, the bodies that, which we observe in the solar system, and also we're starting to see it in planetary systems beyond our own. What we do know is that when the Earth first formed, it was um, subject to a very, very intense bombardment, and the whole of the surface of the Earth was molten. During this time, uh, of course, the moon was formed, which was a, a, a major um, catastrophic event for the Earth, and the Earth must have lost most of its volatile content. Following the formation of the moon, uh, the bombardment, as the solar system sort of settled down, bombardment slowed and the surface of the Earth was no longer molten. As it cooled and solidified, there was still bombardment by asteroids and comets bringing water to the Earth. But now they're adding water, they're adding volatiles, including carbon and nitrogen-based uh, compounds. So what we want to look for when we're looking at some of the first formed objects from the solar system is to look and see the, uh, uh, how much water, how much carbon, what type of compounds are present. And these were the, some of the prime goals of the, um, of the Rosetta mission. Right, the, the mission was a very long mission, um, and this is a timeline here. The launch was in 2004, okay, launched um, from Kourou in um, uh, French Guiana. Uh, and then there were several uh, flybys. Obviously, you can't just launch a rocket to go out to a comet. Uh, it hasn't got sufficient momentum. And so there were three flybys of the Earth and one flyby of Mars to build up sufficient momentum to launch uh, the Rosetta spacecraft out into the uh, further reaches of the solar system. Here's Mars and here's Jupiter, and you can see this is the comet's orbit. Um, it's, it's a very rapid orbit, actually. Uh, 67P comes around about every five to six years. So um, during the, the period of time that Rosetta was actually uh, getting towards the comet, it approached the sun several times, and there was some concern, actually, that because it's such a small comet, it's only about five kilometers across its nucleus, there was some concern that actually um, it might break up before uh, Rosetta got a chance to arrive there. But you can see uh, here, uh, sort of um, just beyond the orbit of Mars, was when Rosetta uh, actually arrived at the comet. And uh, in November 2014, 
sea light, which was a small lander, was um, launched towards the comet or dropped from the comet. Now, this is an image of the comet from um, about, uh, this, is, this is from about June, July. Now, up until then, there had been an assumption that the comet, the nucleus of the comet was approximately spherical, you know, peanut or potato shaped is the usual uh, um, description given to the shape of a comet nucleus. But in, this is July, and see. So in July um, uh, 2014, we got this image. This is the first image we got of the comet seeing what shape it was. Now, I suspect there might be one or two engineers in the audience today. I'm used to giving talks where there are very few engineers, and so I can very free, freely vilify engineers, which I, I guess I shouldn't in this particular forum, <laughs> because I believe engineers tend to be a little bit risk averse. And when they saw this picture of the comet, they said, it's not round, <laughs> uh, and it's not flat. <laughs> so well, there's no way we're going to land feli on there. You know, it's too dangerous because we don't know the mass of the comet, okay? So you see something like this and you think, well, it's got two lobes. Um, and one of the things that it was described as was looking like something like this. And when these images came, you know, people said, uh, you know, oh, duck, or, or something very similar to that. <laughs> and the reason for concern is that it's bilobate, and we don't know whether the two lobes are actually of the same mass or not. We don't know, or we didn't know at the time, whether they were two objects which had collided, um, or whether they were one object which had had great big bits bitten out of it during cratering. And of course, you need to know the mass so that you know the gravitational interaction between the two bodies, the, the lander and the actual comet. And if you, don't know, if you don't know the volume, you can't calculate the mass. So this is why there was a lot of um, sucking in of teeth and, well, actually, I really, really, really don't think we can land on this comet. Fortunately, the engineers, you know, were persuaded that we've been doing this for quite a long time. It would be awfully nice if we did, you know, make a go of it. So the engineers said, right, okay, okay, we'll calculate everything, and yes, we think we can land, as long as the comet remains, you know, fairly flat. Well, unfortunately, by the time we got to October, it was clear that not only was the comet not, you know, a beautiful spherical object, but it was also not flat at all. There are hardly any flat bits on it. And so finding a landing site was very, very difficult indeed. And eventually it was decided that the landing site would be um, on the end, you know, on the sort of front end of uh, um, the comet. And uh, this is, oops, this is an, uh, a picture of the comet in October taken by one of the navigation cameras on the, um, on the Rosetta spacecraft. And here is an image of the comet taken at, the VL, at a similar time uh, on the VLT. Now, the, you can see here, it, it actually looks like a comet. We have a nucleus, we have a tail. And at this stage, the tail is stretching about 100,000 kilometers, so absolutely enormous. But when you're up close to the comet, you don't see that tail. In fact, you can see, uh, I don't know, mm, very difficult to see, but there is actually a jet coming from this neck region of the comet. But it was still, at this time, relatively inactive. And it had to be relatively inactive because Rosetta uh, has a, a, star, um, a star imager and it maintains its navigational position by looking at maps of the stars. And once the comet got too active and there was too much dust coming from the surface of the comet, that really uh, upset the star tracker because it got, got confused. And so by, this, by the time we were um, getting very, very close to the comet, the uh, Rosetta had to retreat to distances of about 100 kilometers. But when we were, when we were uh, um, at the stage when we were going to launch the lander, it was much, much closer. Um, and the surface was still active, 
but you actually can't really see its activity. Okay, so this was the last picture we had of Philae, the Philae lander from Rosetta. And this was uh, November the 14th, no, November the 12th, uh, 2014. At 10 o'clock in the morning, the uh, lander was let go. And the idea was the lander fell, well, we don't know whether it was falling down or falling up, you know, no gravity, um, was falling towards the comet. And um, I, make the, I make the comparison here with the uh, Curiosity lander um, on Mars. And Curiosity had been uh, landed a couple of years previously. And at the time, NASA, which is fantastic at PR, NASA had produced this video called Seven Minutes of Terror. And this was because Curiosity was going to come through Mars's atmosphere uh, and there was going to be seven minutes when there was no contact between uh, Curiosity and ground control because of it coming through the atmosphere and being uh, you know, incandescently hot. So the comparison I make is NASA do seven minutes of terror. This, of course, is a European Space Agency mission. And you know, if NASA can do it, ESA can do it in spades and much, much better. So NASA had seven minutes of terror. ESA had seven hours of tedium. So <laughs> because this was launched at 10 in the morning, and it wasn't actually going to arrive on the comet until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 1,700 hours. So it, it was a, a really strange time um, waiting for this uh, uh, little lander to arrive. It was going to be coming here. You can see we're looking at the, the front end of the comet. And so this was one of the first pictures we got, again, from the navigation uh, cameras on uh, Philae itself, looking at, where, looking at its landing site. And this is one of Philae's uh, legs. In order to land safely, there was a thruster to push Philae down. There was harpoons which were going to fire to anchor Philae, and then three claws on the base of the, the legs to hold it firmly. So there were three uh, fail-safe, absolutely uh, fail-safe ways that Philae was going to land and stay on the comet. And of course, you know, what could possibly go wrong when you've got three uh, things? Well, all three of them seem to have failed, which is a bit sad. This was um, an image 40 meters above the surface, and you can start to see already we've got a very interesting landscape here. We've got very uh, fine-grained dust, some larger boulders, uh, and some several meters across these boulders coming again towards the landing site, again part of Philae. Now, it had been a very, very tense day. And by the time Philae actually landed, and we'd been through this seven hours of waiting and waiting and waiting at headquarters, the release of tension from uh, all the journalists and all the people who were waiting was um, particularly um, joyful because We'd been waiting, not just the 10 years of the launch, 10 years since launch, but all the time prior to that, building the instrument and things like that. And this is a picture of me actually after Philae landed. And it's the sort of thing that I, I don't show the video that goes with it because it's particularly embarrassing. But <laughs> I, was, I was fairly, fairly happy, uh, which was really good. So that's the sort of build-up to the... The launch. Now I'll talk about the instrument that I'm particularly uh, associated with. As I say, the principal investigator is Professor Ian Wright from the Open University, and his core team are listed below. And then there's a whole um, suite of people, uh, here am I, uh, who are uh, co-investigators and doing science support. And this is a picture of the Ptolemy instrument with, um, that's Andy Morse, the deputy PI, that's his um, hand there for scale. 
These are ends. What, what, what do you call these? Preliminary sketches. And the only reason I'm showing them is for the date, okay? January 1993. So this is when we had our first meeting to discuss what became the Ptolemy instrument, okay? So 20 years later, 21 years later, when Ptolemy actually arrived, you know, you can see it's been a long time in the making. So this was um, what was going to happen. Uh, this was the evolved gas analysis, again, January 1993. Ian has the most appalling handwriting, and it hasn't got any better in the um, succeeding years. By 1994, the gas analysis package had uh, got a little bit more complicated in dealing with the volatiles. And by the time the thing actually arrived, um, this is what um, the diagram, this is what, you know, the system diagram of it, of the Ptolemy instrument. And the idea is uh, these two tanks here are of helium. And let me go back to this thing. So you have um, a sample inlet here, and you've got a whole load, I'm not expecting you to, to read this diagram, you've got a whole, ro whole load of valves and all, all bits and pieces and the idea was at um, one stage, the instrument was going to sniff the gas. So gas was going to come into the instrument and follow a path um, and to go into the mass spectrometer here. It was also going to be able to take solid samples from the drill, which would follow a diff slightly different path and go into a whole series of ovens before then going back into the mass spectrometer. And the idea of the ovens was it would heat up the gas, oxidize, sorry, heat up the solid, oxidize anything in there to carbon dioxide and water, and measure the isotopic composition. So this was part of the purpose of the heating part in the oven, was to convert everything into carbon dioxide and water so we could measure the carbon 12 to 13 C ratio of the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen to deuterium ratio of the water. Sadly though, because Philae, instead of landing like this, landed like that, the drill, which was going to be coming out from, from the bottom, you know, was drilling, I, I can't say drilling into thin air, but drilling into nothing. And so no material was actually taken and put into the ovens directly by the drill. So there's only a small amount of data which came, has come from the dust, which was kicked up as Philae landed and actually went into the ovens. So we only got a limited amount of data from that part of the experiment. But what you can see here is you have the gas inlet, you have a whole series of things to clean up the, um, the gas to get rid of sulfur, for instance, which we knew was going to be a real contaminant. And then you have the actual mass spectrometer itself down here. And this is um, the detector. It's the size of a cotton reel, okay? So the detector is the size of a cotton reel. The actual instrument itself is the size of a shoebox. And the Philae lander is the size of a washing machine. So that is the international scale of spaceflight instrumentation, a cotton reel in a shoebox on a washing machine. So they, this is uh, an iron trap mass spectrometer. We have an electron source, which are made of carbon um, nanotips, um, which ionize any of the gas which is, um, comes into the iron trap, and then the voltage is maintained sufficiently that you can then release ions of a specific mass, uh, which then go into the ion detector, and we have the ion count electronics. Okay, so this is a, as I say, very, very small. And since actually building this, we've got things down, not just to a cotton reel, but to something uh, about the size, it's about a centimeter across. We can now build these mass spectrometers. Unfortunately, our instrument was the first that had to be integrated onto Rosetta. So we had to deliver the instrument in 2001. Uh, so that other things could be integrated ahead of it. And so you've, you've delivered an instrument in 2001 and you know it's not going to be used until 2014. And so there is a certain amount of um, worry that it's actually not going to work when you get there. 
Uh, fortunately, it um, did work. Now, this is a, um, um, a, a, a graph of time against um, magnetic field. And what you can see here is touchdown of sea life. Boom, that's, that's when it actually landed. The magnetometer detected its landing. Unfortunately, it also detected the fact that it didn't stay put. And we can see from the magnetometer trace that um, two hours later, it touched down again, and about half an hour or five minutes after that, it touched down a third time. So we believe that actually Phili landed, bounced, and bounced again. So it touched down uh, three times. Now, this is actually a very, very clever um, move by ESA. If we'd said we wanted to go and explore three different places on the comet, <laughs> it would have thought to have been too expensive. So we did it on the sly, which is very clever. <laughs> so this is what happened. It, it landed, bounced, bounced, and we believe it's here on the edge of this beautiful flat sunlit plain where it was supposed to land. So it landed in the dark, and what that actually meant uh, was that the, the solar panels that were going to charge the secondary battery couldn't work. So we only had 70 hours of the preliminary, uh, of the primary uh, battery. Now, we got about 80% of the science done in those 70 hours, and Ian is very proud of the fact that his was the last experiment which drained the battery to zero, all right? So Ian's experiment killed, killed sea life. This is a, uh, you probably can't read it, but this is a timeline of what uh, the experiments that they actually did over, over the course of the 70 hours. And so they got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They got eight sets of data, which has been fantastic, uh, starting from the preliminary stuff to this here, which is called the last gasp. And this is analyzing material collected in the oven during the bounce. Uh, all right, okay, so this is the SNF, which is going just straight into the ion trap mass spectrometer. And these are the results that um, we got from the mass spectrum, okay? So these might look a lot like Richard's spectra, but of course, instead of wavelength down here, you've got mass to charge ratio. Once you've actually deconvoluted what it means, again, we have mass to charge ratio on the bottom here, and... Um, you can see, oh, there are two different, these sort of add, add up together. Um, highlighted in blue, what's happened here is we have taken away the water, mass 18, and the CO2, mass 44, because that overwhelmed absolutely everything. And this is the spectra, uh, this is the spectrum that was left behind. The red line here are data from the spe mass spectrometer that was on Halley's Comet in 1986. And this spectrum, you can see, matches reasonably well with some of the peaks. Because what happens is your, a, a big molecule goes into one of these um, mass spectrometers and it gets broken down and you have a characteristic cracking pattern. And it's not just that you look at a single peak, you have to look at a whole series of peaks and fragments to see what you've got. Now, this spectrum on Halley was interpreted as polyoxymethylene, POM. And polyoxymethylene is something which breaks down to give sugars. And so this was a first recognition in Halley, and it was reinforced by the data from Ptolemy for Comet 67P, that actually the building blocks of sugars are bound in the nucleus of these comets. This is interpretation of the other um, peaks here in the spectra. The ones in green are, are um, firm analyses of something that was definitely there. So you can see that there was actually these, uh, um, uh, ethyl, um, ethanol was there, uh, argon was there, which is very interesting, plenty of water. Um, plenty of other um, nitrogen-bearing compounds. The masses in amber are things that we thought were going to be there, but there doesn't seem to be very much of. 
And so um, nitrogen, we thought there would be lots of nitrogen leading to nitrogen-bearing compounds like ammonia, but that seemed to be missing. And then we've got a whole load of these things circled in red, which we haven't actually yet managed to interpret. So we're still working on what the cracking pattern is, which produces these rather strange masses. So we found very little nitrogen, and we found uh, very little sulfur, which was uh, surprising. All right, so I, have a f I think this is my uh, last slide. So um, the interpretation of, of what Ptolemy found was that we had regular mass distributions indicating the presence of these compounds, which is polyoxymethylene. We've got a lot of radiation-induced polymer at the surface of CG. So that's not uh, one of our observations, that's a general observation. And the surface of 67P is really black, really, really black. All the pictures that you see of the comet have been enhanced to bring out different, um, bring out different features. But it is incredibly black. It has an albedo of about 0.06. Um, but even though we have this radiation-induced polymer, there seems to be a lack of um, aromatic compounds like benzene, which again was very, very surprising. We thought there would be quite a lot of, of change, partly because we know what is in meteorites. Like a sulfur species, very low concentrations of nitrogen-bearing components. This is my final slide, which is a picture of uh, Comet CG in all its glory. Stelae has gone into eternal hibernation, is the phrase used by ESA, which sounds a bit, uh, sounds a bit final, really. What's going to happen is on the 30th of September, uh, there will be a controlled landing by Rosetta onto the comet. And we're hoping to get, it's, not, it's going to be reasonably close, it's going to be on the same lobe of the, um, of the comet as Philae, but it's not going to be close to Philae. We know now from uh, other measurements that the comet, the bilobate comet, is actually two separate bodies which came together in a low velocity collision. However, the, um, the spectral data, the compositional data from, uh, uh, from an instrument actually on the Rosetta um, orbiter show that the material properties and the composition of the two lobes are very, very similar, and they seem to have similar densities, which again is incredibly uh, low. They're about 80% space, 80, uh, you know, porosity of about 80%. What we've seen then is we have a low albedo, high porosity, very, very black body, which is giving out huge jets in enormous amount. It's a very, very active comet. Uh, what we're hoping to find is when we uh, uh, land again for a second time on the comet to get more pictures, more close-ups of what the surface of it is like. Results from uh, one of the instruments on board, Rosetta itself, from the Rosina instrument, has shown that glycine is there. This is something that was uh, announced a couple of weeks ago. So glycine is there, water is there, CO2 is there, sugars are there. All the building blocks of life, phosphorus is there. So all the building blocks of life are there. What's really, really interesting is calcium aluminium rich minerals are there. These are refractory minerals formed at very, very high temperatures. So you've got something in this comet, you've got a lot of organics formed at low temperatures, ices, low temperatures, comets formed beyond the snow line. But you've got very refractory minerals there, which must have been formed much, much closer to the sun. So this comet is carrying materials from close to the sun and from far out from the sun. And this is showing that these objects are really strange we still don't know enough about them. And so what we really need is another mission to a comet, preferably one which brings back material for us to analyze in the lab. Thank you.